I'd just like to begin by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people uh, who are the traditional owners of the land on which I'm coming to you from um, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so today we have yet another uh, sort of cultural studies focus. So uh, Chris, last week we had Ian Buchanan present um, for us. Um, so Chris Miller is a lecturer in cultural studies and media at Macquarie University. His research examines the intersection of technology and emotion. He's the author of Prometheanism, Technology, Digital Culture and Human Obsolescence, and is currently translating Gunther Anders' Die Antique Wirtheit des Menschen, that German there, <laughs> um, into English. <laughs> Chris also co-edits the genealogy of the post-human. And the title of Chris's talk today is We Are Born Obsolete, Shame, Laughter, and the Monstrous Every Day. So over to you, Chris. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Catherine. And, and thanks, everyone. It's really uh, great to be able to present here today. Um, I'd also like to start by acknowledging country. Um, I'm on Gadigal land, belonging to the Eora Nation. Um, so it's a you know great to be here um, and be presenting. And I guess a lot of what I'm talking about is being reconfigured since I arrived in Australia and getting used to, I guess, a settler colonial reality and and the kind of layers of history that build up um, into the present and into a very normal everyday that feels normal, but at the same time has these massive ethical, political, moral challenges that are with us with every step we take. And a lot of my work um, engages with those kind of disjunctures and those kind of mismatches between the kind of ease of everyday life and, and I guess the structural violence that is somewhere rooted in technology and technological mediation. So what I'll present today is kind of a bit of a a mixture between really well-rehearsed materials. I've been working on Gunther Anders quite a long time and I'll contextualize his thought in the course of this talk. But I'm also finding, I guess, finding new interests. And uh, one of those interests is, I guess, online humor and, and the kind of laughter which we use to get through the day and this new reality of spending so much time online and, and I guess the sense of exposure that brings along and a certain kind of um, mixture between paranoia and nonchalance or something like that. It's, that's kind of how I'm framing it in today's talk. So I'll start with um, a quote by Gunther Anders, which will hopefully explain the term monster in my talk. So this is from the book I'm translating, and he says, entities that cannot be classified used to be called monstrous. They were, they were called thus because although they are somehow here, stalking the world and troubling existence, they have no identifiable being. When asked what they are, these monsters simply laugh back at the question. And I guess for me, um, this quote is Anders' thought in a nutshell. Um, he's actually here speaking about atom bombs in an essay about nuclear weapons. He's talking about this new reality of living in the shadow of uh, the nuclear devices. So in 1955, we get the first hydrogen bomb tests, and this is a big media spectacle. And he's talking about the fact that, oh, even though we know that these machines exist and that we live in this nuclear age, somehow we can't pinpoint what that means. There's just this kind of emotional, uh, this new, I guess, effective structure. And so Anders takes us into uh, a realm that is quite bleak and, and I'll, I'll speak to that in a moment, but I see a certain resonance between this quote and this kind of this kind of meme. So we have here a beautiful meme <laughs> talking about, uh, you know, the experience of being on Zoom all day. And I guess it's not quite a monster, but it's kind of a composite image uh, that is overlaying, somehow creating 
an image, an anthropomorphic representation or a video game representation of the Zoom meetings and, and the kind of rhythm that is imposed on us through lockdowns and this mediation. And I think it speaks to this intuition that something big is happening. There is this kind of shift. We don't really know how to articulate um, what is happening, but we're trying to catch up to a new reality. And I think it fits into this idea of there being something monstrous. And indeed, it is exactly this, this theme, um, what Anders calls a growing gap between what we can make and produce and what we can imagine and explain. That is like the core theme of his book, The Antiquiotype as mentioned, which you actually pronounced really well, Catherine. Um, so I just bring up this table of content and give you a sense of what this book is. So a lot of my work, I guess, could be described as translation-led. Um, so Günther Stern Anders, for those of you who do not know him, is a really remarkable thinker. Um, he kind of cuts through the whole intellectual history of uh, continental Europe. So he was a cousin of uh, Walter Benjamin. It's often mentioned that he's kind of, he was married to Hannah Arendt, a student of Husserl and Heidegger, that kind of trajectory. But then he's forced into exile, spends a lot of time in the US. And in a sense, I guess, the whole book could be classed as an allergic reaction to American culture. And um, so he writes this book, which is called The Antiquity of This Mansion, and it's conceptualized as a book for what he calls a post-literary age. So for people who no longer read. Um, so it's written in this very strange style. He uses philosophy, but he also uses a lot of diary entries, observations. And it's got these four chapters. The two that I'll focus on especially are uh, the first chapter, which is called On Promethean Shame, which is about um, the humiliatingly high quality of technological objects. So it's kind of about the feeling of unease, of somehow being outdone or outmastered or feeling humiliated in the course of interacting with a machine. Um, I guess in terms of your research center's focus, it's especially the second chapter, The World is Phantom and Matrix, that might be of great interest to you once it comes out. Um, so the core idea in that chapter is that, um, kind of anticipating what Derrida says about spectres, that the world that is broadcast live and that arrives as this, like an image or in our ears, isn't a representation. It's actually a real experience and a real reaction to it, but it's a phantom, right? It's this kind of ghostly presence. And um, this connects back to kind of ideas. So already in the 1930s, he's writing about ideas of technological haunting and that we're somehow trying to understand these ghosts that are haunting our lives. And then the big chapter, the one that has probably been received the biggest attention in the English-speaking world, I think, um, is called On the Bomb and the Roots of Our Blindness Towards the Apocalypse, which is really, a kind of really visionary again in its scope, where he says, well, we've kind of already destroyed the world because we've produced a device that has already virtually destroyed it. <laughs> so uh, we live only until we use the machine we already have. Um, but at the same time, we're somehow unable to bring up the appropriate quantum of fear. And a lot of people have used this kind of framework to think about things like climate change. And there's a, a big flow of books. I mean, this is the most recent one called After the Apocalypse by Sreko Horvath, that is kind of taking this, this logic and, and mapping it onto the present. So, and you will see from the kind of sales, the book actually found quite a remarkable reach, uh, found quite a wide audience in, in, in its, and it, it keeps on being published. It's just been a re-edition. Um, but it's only now really that it's being picked up in, in academic circles. Um, so under style, as I said, is quite unique, quite hard to kind of locate. It's quite hard to kind of file it into various um, existing paradigms. So it took a long time until people realized that the playfulness and, 
and also gloom that is in this book actually comes out of a kind of a methodological necessity. Um, and I just wanted to say, by the way, please feel free to interrupt me at any point. I'll, I'll just go through some slides. Um, I hope I won't um, ramble on too long, but um, we will get to, I'll just bring up a timer for myself to make sure that I have a bit of a sense how, how long I've been going. Um, so I'll just quickly um, situate some of what Anders does so you can understand where he's coming from. So the tradition he's speaking from is called philosophical anthropology. It's again, kind of a slightly forgotten school of German thought. And it's uh, the central thesis it has is that um, our, we have this tendency to completely misapprehend our own abilities and misnarrate them. So I might quickly shop this there, uh, share just to give you a bit of a break from that slide. So. The school of thought says, well, in language, you say something like, I'm going to call you later, or I'm going to text you. But that experience erases the fact that it's actually the phone that is doing all of that for you. So you have this bodily ability to somehow forget the mediated nature of our agency. I'm experiencing myself as speaking right now, right? But I'm born into the English and German language, and that enables me to acquire that capacity and it's shaped by all sorts of factors. And um, so in this line of thinking, something like our feelings, emotions, thoughts, everything that comes spontaneously to us is the sign of what Helmut Plesner, a German thinker from the 1920s, calls mediated immediacy. So it's this kind of ability to forget ourselves to, to the world, to feel natural. And Günther Anders kind of fits into that tradition. He quite openly um, affiliates his work to that. And I guess for me, the exciting thing has always been that it tries to make this bridge to anthropology, biology. And there's this image that human beings have evolved to become technological beings. So when we think of our, uh, the title I gave, We Are Born Obsolete, that's actually the name of an evolutionary advantage. After humans are born, we, we're kind of born naked, but we supplement ourselves. We can acquire all these skills by embodying technology. But um, there's also a certain paradox because as technology evolves and the earliest technological implements are roughly 3 million years old. So they predate the species Homo sapiens by about 2.8 million years or something like that. So, so about almost 3 million years pass in the kind of anthro like anthropomorphic, uh, like our humanoid ancestors slowly turn into us in, in the course of a 3 million year interaction between tool and and an organism that leads to an upright stance, the free hands, an ability to articulate. So there's really this um, ability. But um, the paradox that Anders, I guess, emerges from is that the, the more our technological capacity grows, and that's obviously historical and collective and produced by many people, the bigger the gap becomes between who you are with a device and without a device, right? So in, in, I guess, what I would call the European medieval period, there's not a, a massive difference between someone who has access to a sword or not, <laughs> even though the person with access to a sword has a certain advantage. But of course, as we know today, you know, the difference between someone who has access to the whole computational infrastructure and all the kind of ways of life that um, that entails and someone who does not, for better or worse, is vast, right? It, 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 it's a very different kind of experience of, of living and agency and a different relationship to the immediate environment that is at play. So these are the kind of ideas that flow or underpin this work, the obsolescence of 
human being, or that's the, the title I'm using. I'll just bring this up. Um, these are just some of the, the thoughts. Ah, oh, yeah, and so technology, I guess, in this way of thinking can't be defined as a constellation of things. It doesn't get you very far to think, oh, where do I find technology? It's more um, a space of possibility. So where are your, what can you do uninhibited? What, what, what kind of agency do you enjoy? And a really good example uh, that runs through the school of thought is, is clothing. Um, the idea that somehow the feeling of nakedness or the feeling of nudity is in itself a product of having naturalized clothes, right? It, there's only after you have somehow turned the artificial cover into what is intuitive, natural, normal, that the removal of it can take on any kind of effective or symbolic significance. So that would be a really good example of a, a mediated immediacy. Where you, and I guess if we think of the way in which nature and culture are often opposed and, and the kind of way that interdisciplinary work often happens, you can see that we have a slightly different approach here because to, to philosophical anthropology, it would make no sense to say, well, there's this naked body that is dressed in a cloak, like a cape of culture, because the feeling of nakedness is in itself a product of this ability to embody an artificial body, right? To become like someone new, as they call it, to so the self-production of the human. So this brings me to this kind of feeling, that feeling of nakedness. And so I'll have a, a few memes. I will start talking about these a bit more directly a bit later down the line. But this is usually, um, this is an exercise I, um, I did together with Ty Nielsen, with whom I um, co-convene a big um, undergraduate media course <clears throat> at Macquarie. Sorry. <clears throat> And um, yeah, and so we ask our students to just complete the sentence without my smartphone, I feel. And, and you will see that it kind of matches this emotional constellation that I'm sure you're somehow used to, this kind of frustration, this deprivation. Um, we get these, these kind of notions of feeling lost, disconnected, anxious, of course, also freedom. And in this word cloud that is completed, I think, by about 160 students, you will also see the odd humorous remark pop up. So people will say, oh, I feel like, like finding my phone, like, you know, monk, like a monk, all these kind of. So I guess this compensatory humor that, that comes up the moment we are somehow deprived of someone, something we've took really for granted is, is, is a pattern that I'm very interested in, and I think it's a pattern that Anders' work and is trying to kind of connect to this, to the world that kind of exceeds our imagination, this um, world of hyper-complex machines that he's starting to think. So Anders' work approaches this through what he calls a method of philosophical exaggeration. And I'll probably leave the slide up here so you can kind of get used to that word. So it's a kind of inverted phenomenology. So he would pick something like that feeling, oh, you know, the, the frustration when we don't have Wi-Fi. And it's kind of saying, oh, these are moments when we feel something we usually don't. We feel our dependence on this technology and we feel on how much of our agency has actually been outsourced, delegated onto whoever runs your Wi-Fi or whatever company has taken charge of that. And, um, and he's saying this, this journey is ever more necessary because there's this absolute gap between what we can actually do and the power we can exercise and what we can actually feel or apprehend, right? You can't imagine um, a, a great example here would be, you know, you might be able to know that you're drive by driving, you're contributing to climate change, but because it's such a cumulative outcome that that's a very tall ask for that to translate back into your 
kind of bodily senses group or oh, I shouldn't drive. Um, the, the idea of an inversion happening between making and imagining. So he has a really beautiful kind of little parable that, it, that I use quite a lot. He says, um, we're inverted utopians. So normal, so the dilemma of kind of European thought was always that you could imagine worlds that you couldn't create. Um, and he says, well, the problem is for us, we've collectively created a world we can no longer imagine. So he's kind of flipping that image. And a lot of his kind of writing um, has to do with that, with that work. And the slogan becomes the slogan, I still don't get it. And he lifts, he lifts this slogan from a newspaper report of an American bomber pilot who in 1955 has a very public kind of uh, like kind of depression or he, he feels severe remorse or he's trying to feel severe remorse for his participation in bombing raids against cities but he can't get he can't kind of reconnect the dots he can't figure out well what was me in all of this where what was my part i was like part of like this fleet of bombers and i want to know who i am right so and anders is saying oh in its simplicity this his little sentence i still don't get it is kind of exemplary for all of us it's the world it's the kind of gap that is mapping onto the obsolete world of traditional ethics in which we kind of rely on our sense of good or bad or feeling to guide us through life we're saying well that measure clearly has been somehow blindsided by this um, by this development, and to communicate that he's really insisting on a mode of address that is exaggerated. <laughs> so he compares it actually to satire, caricature, to kind of saying, "Oh, you must take these little instances, these little gaps when something becomes visible, and extend the line, exaggerate where it will lead, and then the contour of that will become." visible. And so his work entails the portrayal of everyday objects and phenomena and to kind of pierce through what he calls this monstrous veneer of the everyday. So this, this kind of invisibility that envelops things. Um, so I hope that kind of makes sense or gives you a sense of where he's coming from. And I'll just, uh, I guess, give you the punchline of it all, which is his theory of, or the general formula of, of complex technology um, is this little word without us that he comes up with as a kind of a, a very handy way to start talking about automation, absent-mindedness, absent-heartedness, oligarchic concentrations of power that kind of form around modern technological objects. And to do so, he presents the atom bomb as the exemplary technology. So not as some kind of exception, but he's saying, this is the machine as the most powerful machine. It shows you the kind of intimate portrait of every other machine that you have, right? Of every other complex machine. And what he's saying is this quote, and I'll just read that out. Um, what we aim at with machines is to produce an effect that does not require our presence or help an effect which unfolds without lament and complaint. What we exclusively aim at are machines, the functions of which make us superfluous, turn us off and liquidate us. It is irrelevant that this target condition is only ever approximated. What counts is the tendency, and this is without us. Um, so this is, a really complex quote and I guess I could talk about the various layers it has for a really long time um, but I guess what he's pointing towards is that we can't really talk about objects in the same way anymore um, like technological objects are no longer just phenomena they don't show what they do there's a certain process happening, a process of removal, sanitation, um, sanitation of violence. So a great example would be um, 
well, I guess where this comes from is from, I think, um, Harry Truman's speech. I think, did I put it on the slide? Let's put it, yeah. So it's, it's, it's really, um, I think, inspired by Harry Truman's radio address on the day of Hiroshima, which Anders talks about at great length. And Truman introduced to the world, he wanted to kind of set this ultimatum to Japan that um, they should surrender. And to do so, he uses this rhetoric that explains to the world what the atom bomb is. <laughs> and he says, well, over two, I think it's two and a half, uh, 250,000 people have been involved in making this device. And he says that many have worked there for two and a half years. Few know what they have been producing. They see great quantities of material going in and they see nothing coming out of these plants. And I guess in the time of war, this was kind of celebrating or the speech goes on to celebrate the efficiency of the state apparatus to keep this device secret and to kind of organize everything, but also to impress on, on I guess, the audience of that or the recipients, the Japanese government at the time, that this device was incredibly small, but incredibly powerful. And I think what Anders takes from this is that this nothing becomes the exemplary output of machine interaction. So if we want to understand this without us, it's the kind of, so what are you doing when you're shopping? Oh, you know, nothing, it's normal. I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm in this world in which we don't see anything extraordinary. We don't see the kind of chains of violence. So we don't see the part we play in the production of something that cumulatively might have, might result in the destruction of a city, but it's governed by thousands and thousands of small steps that aren't registered as such. Right? So that's the, I think, the process he, he wants to go towards. Um, so in my own work, in, in I think the book, Catherine, you mentioned, I make this analogy between the smartphone and the atom, atomic bomb to explain this. And I'll, I think I'll stop the share quickly because it might help because, um, so I compare that logic to the way we interact with smartphones. And we might know that every keystroke, everything we do generates data. We have no idea what that data may be used for, right? It may be used to help automate a speech recognition algorithm, it may be used to save someone's, uh, you know, to have a really beneficial effect or a really bad effect, or all of those effects at once or none at all. But the point is, we don't know, right? Uh, we're completely, we're generating the, I guess, fuel or the, the information, the data that smart devices need to operate and mimic human capacities. But all of that imitation and all of that work happens in a sense with, with our full knowledge, <laughs> but at the same time without our active consent. And it would be quite, a, I mean, Anders was really fond of making absurd analogies. And I think it would be an analogy, it would be really absurd if you felt the kind of level of inhibition you might feel about at the foot of slapping someone or something like that, just simply by uh, interacting with your phone, right? But that's kind of what he's saying. You need to realize this is a moral interaction you're engaged with, but it's not, your body will never register it. And he's not saying you should register it, right? He's saying it's impossible. You cannot, we, we are far too limited as organisms to ever reach into that world of abstraction. So it's that cumulative um, action, right? That is really at the heart of, of his thought. So how to respond to this, right? So what is his outcome? So in a sense, he's, on the one hand, his aim is to point out the absurdity that we still insist on this moral morality and, and this politics, this human scale of the thinking and feeling I as being the, the measure of immorality and morality when we've created a world that is all intent of kind of bypassing that. Um, and his di diagnosis here matches that of Gilbert um, Simondon. I don't know if you if you know his work. So it's a kind of roughly contemporary analysis in French thought, a philosophical, a philosophical kind of response to technological innovation. And Simondon says something like, "Isn't it absurd that all our ethical and political uh, 
frameworks and he's speaking about like our here means european uh, french kind of enlightenment tradition so the western way of thinking about ethics and politics kind of emerges from an ancient world in which you know technological power was was limited to to detachable implements and tools and so you needed to regulate human bodies because you know they might throw a spear at you so you were regulating the human bodies because the technological power is really limited but in the meantime we live in a world in which most actions and most kind of factors that shape reality and that is governed by politics is actually a world of machines right and that's somehow this massive moral void and both kind of come up with this like both Anders and Simon Dron come to the conclusion that we live in this kind of dual reality of kind of somehow knowing this because it's kind of obvious but at the same time having developed certain attitudes and emotional structures to just bat it away to bat the foot away and keep it at bay and that's really where this idea of Promethean shame for Anders comes in that's one of the access points so he says how can we get through this veneer well you could focus on the thing that maintains it and he says well our our kind of silence or our compliance and this is possibly an exaggerated image that might sound quite absurd he's saying well because you feel stupid when interacting with the machine or because the machine is constantly kind of an inverted image of what you can't do right i can't calculate as efficiently or well as my computer all these kind of like because it becomes like the kind of image of all the things we cannot do we're also somehow secretly humiliated by this reality and we kind of become very compliant and i think there's a really um interesting um analogy to be made um to and i might just kind of come back to this slide and i might just come to i'm just seeing if the, if the time so i think there's a certain analogy to be made um to these kind of memes so i don't know if you know this kind of genre of humor it's a very popular genre online it's um this kind of very elaborate ritualization of not reading the terms and conditions in which you know we have the perfect example that we are still asked for our consent and being held responsible for our acts all of this interaction with machines is still mapped onto this traditional landscape in which i have the choice to not uh, participate and i guess all of these memes are somehow calling out well this is a charade we have no choice we, i have not really got i mean you can of course not take um, take part in in social media platforms but at a certain level um what we lose out on is a lot and the idea that we're all agreeing in this participation is just not um is just not an accurate representation of what is happening um so i can unpack some of these um memes maybe later but I think this is one of those symptoms in which we're kind of very publicly and very openly confessing to a certain <laughs> I don't know if it if I would call it resistance but it seems to have this at first instance we might think oh we're trying trying to repoliticize or rehumanize this dimension but there's of course an added irony that these memes are precisely shared on the kind of platforms we've already signed to so it's kind of more a, a compensatory guest gesture right so in terms of how i frame this um logic in in my own work um and i might just go back to to this to these slides and i'll remove a few so i don't know how familiar you are with uh, contemporary um media theory and, and attempts to to kind of conceptualize what it actually is that we're doing when we're interacting on digital platforms and what the power of platforms are and there's just this one i guess agreement that there's this monstrous moral void that somehow we have created this universe that is toxic hard to regulate hard to kind of understand and there's all sorts of attempts um, 
to quantify this. So Anne Catherine Hale is a famous post-humanist thinker. She's pointing out just simply how inadequate <laughs> the ethical frameworks are that focus on the individual user or the individual um, conception of ethics tied back to ideas of autonomy and, and feeling. We have Benjamin Bratton, who's talking a lot about anthropocentric fallacies when he's trying to say, well, we're constantly being invited to think about artificial intelligence along human terms and a lot of effort is invested to make us think about, oh, will there ever will it be possible to have a human like robot? And he says, well, that's all kind of a big deflection away from the fact that that's not really the issue when it comes to um, our current technological environment, um, because it's clearly very easy to create a computer that tricks us into believing that it has a personality, even though it's just an algorithm that is kind of pulling us on. Uh, Tony Sampson, who came up or talked a lot about virality, he's got a recent book called The Sleepwalker's Guide to Social Media, where he draws on Tard's media theory to talk about kind of collective hypnosis, collective sleepwalking, to come up with this kind of new idea of subjectivity. Um, Louise Amura, um, Cloud Ethics, a really great book. Um, and I guess her example comes the closest to the moral universe on this map side. So she uses the example of participating at a protest or going to a protest march in London. And so the police in London has this algorithm, this smart city application, which predicts protests by listening to kind of social media chat and by like feeding in CCTV kind of data analytics in real time. And they have a real time score. How likely is there to be civil unrest in this area? And she points out there's an irony here that by participating in the process, protests, you generate the data that will be used to suppress protests, right? So it's kind of the exact opposite of what you think you're doing. You think you're protesting, but actually you're helping policing happen in the smart city, right? So, so she's talking about the way our acts in, in a datafied reality can be co-opted in these ways. Um, and then we have very, I guess, front end or very user-centric approaches that point to something very similar. I don't know if you know Jenny O'Dell. She's got a really lovely book uh, called How to Do Nothing, Escaping the Attention Economy. And it's kind of an airport book, a really wonderfully well-written book, where she's talking about, oh, there's this excitement of, of being on, on social media. But all the while, there's also this, this nervosity, there's this kind of this thought that something isn't right that lingers. And we have Sophie Bishop as well, who's kind of doing very similar work when she's interacting with, she, she does empirical work with influencers who somehow have this um, imaginary relationship to an algorithm, right? They think, oh, I need to post this in this way at this and this time, because otherwise the algorithm will kind of not promote my content. So all of these interactions, all of these attempts, I guess, to pinpoint what is it that we're doing when we're online? How can we conceptualize this? All of these, I guess, phenomena, they're just everyday monstrous phenomena. They escape ways of framing or traditional Western ethics really struggles to frame these as moral problems. And I guess that brings me back to um, under this idea of the monstrous as being this um, this access point, perhaps this this presence of something that is quite distinctly there as something that we can't really grasp, and it has this certain certain uh, phenomenological reality. <laughs> it is it is somehow a spectral presence, but at the same time, it's really hard to pinpoint what it is. And for me, I've been thinking about this a, a bit. As I said, this is like kind of the, the, the part of my work I'm, I'm, I'm developing at the moment. 
And I started to really think about the function of this kind of humor. At first, at first I thought, well, this is kind of cool. It's kind of remoralizing or it's kind of calling out these practices that we kind of teach in digital media when we, when we try, to, try to kind of visualize or, or somehow reveal or somehow expose some of the practices big, big digital platforms are engaged with. And then I realized this probably something slightly more depressing <laughs> at the bottom of it, that um, platforms that don't offer you that relief would simply fail, right? You could simply not use a computer if, if it didn't somehow generate as part of the interaction with it and as part of the social reality of it, this kind of relief humor. So I don't know how familiar you are with humor studies. So I'm getting into that field at the moment. It's really, really fascinating. And these are all, I guess, examples of what I would call relief humor. So they, 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 they feed off the buildup of some kind of emotional tension or nervous tension. And they kind of get rid of that tension by kind of... Um, offering you relief from shame. And in affect theory, in, in the study of affect, laughter is considered one of the soul tonics, the, the, one of the really um, most effective ways to combat embarrassment and shame. We kind of laugh, we try to laugh it off. And if the situation allows for it, we will laugh it off and, and we will cope. And it's part of a coping mechanism. Um, very famous discussion of this is by Henri Bergson, who, who calls laughter the anesthesia of the heart, right? The, the heart that kind of helps you cope with this kind of reality. Um, so I think rather than simply having this framing in which this kind of humor is somehow the reaction of a, of a user somehow trying to assert their their authority or their individuality. I think they're just simply moments we are offered as relief as a means to interact with um, technology. So they have to kind of be thought of as part of this without us formula, right? They're somehow part of this monstrous, I wouldn't call it automation because I think it automation always suggests that the thing that happens automatically now existed in the similar form before, but in some in some kind of way, um, an automation of of decision making and and these kind of terms that are very popular now. Um, so I'm just going to quickly look at the time. I think this might be a good good place to to just simply stop and and open it up to to a conversation. Um, I've given you a bit of a sense, I hope, where, where my thinking is going. I have a couple more slides. If, if the discussion lends itself, we can, we can return to them. And well, thanks for your attention. Thanks, Chris. That was, uh, that was really fascinating. Um, lots of the uh, clapping hand uh, emojis. So we've got 15 minutes for questions. Um, who would like to ask a question? Glenn. Good day. Can you hear me? Am I turned on? Okay. Yep. Yep. Hi, Chris. Sorry, I was um, a bit late meetings, sliding into other meetings and all kinds of dumb things happening. Um, <laughs> but I'm glad I, I, I did manage to log on. Uh, that was fantastic. Thanks, mate. That was really interesting. Um, it really resonates, God, it resonates with the sense of trying to navigate a complex, not technological, but it's kind of socio-technical in some ways, space, like around things like home loans and stuff, where there's all these rules and different, there are lots of platforms and all kinds of ways to get advice and all kinds of things. But it's just like trying to navigate that space, it does feel monstrous. And it's like, it isn't just kind of social media platforms that, you know, have terms and conditions. There's all these other things that seem to produce a, like this, this kind of relation of like alienation from one's own sense of what's going on in a situation. Because you keep on digging through more and more information about what needs to happen in a given process, um, you know, trying to sense what's happening in the market. The market itself is another monstrous thing. And like at every point of the process, you have to reach out to these special kind of mediators, the broker, 
the the lawyer, the the real estate agent, who have this kind of mystical understanding, right, of, of what's going on, and it, and it's fascinating. Like, just it made me think of your thing. Made me think of that 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 joke on Twitter. Those 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 screen caps that are shared, where it's someone makes an assertion about something. At the moment, it's about vaccinations or whatever. Then you've got some, you know, pretty loose unit who says something, you know, what about this, la la la, you know, the horse medicine, whatever it is. And you know, what are your qualifications? And then the person comes back and says, well, I've got a Nobel Prize and this, blah, blah, blah. you know, you, you know that classic joke on Twitter that exchange, where someone feels like because they can be in contact with on a similar level to do a communication that they're equal to the knowledge base of someone else. But actually, they don't realize that the massive distance in like understanding around something. And I don't know, there's something going on there to do with um, how these platforms, on the one hand, kind of make it easier, Google search and stuff. It is an excellent tool if, you know, you can use it and things. But you think about students who just Google things and don't use it as an excellent tool. And then it becomes this weird monstrous you know, way of like not using things because of this weird, I don't know, there's something, there's, there's, it, it just resonated with me, this notion of monstrousness and shame is that the students are like completely shameless in how they do that. There's people on Twitter or whatever are like completely shameless with how they interact with like Nobel Prize winners and stuff. You know, I don't really care and I don't have a sense of shame about interacting with mortgage brokers and things because, you know, whatever, they're like <laughs> mortgage brokers. So, but, it's, uh, but it's just, it's, I don't know, it just resonated with me that sense of, one monstrosity and the the way in which different kinds of knowledge gets specialized and how even though things have flattened out a little bit with the tools and apparatuses that we have it's it's still extremely difficult to get access to it because you know it seems to our access is mediated in some way anyway that's it i've gone off on a tangent but anyway it just that that just really resonated with me just thinking about it like that yeah no thank you so much and i mean it's an exceptionally astute observation i think the analogy with mortgage brokers and all those kind of contracts and all those lists is actually one that anders makes himself um quite frequently he will quite frequently bring up something like um the kind of leaflet in a medical <laughs> in a medical um like kind of the side effects that are being communicated to us uh, he i should say he had a very severe uh, arthritis and it's something that is Quite, quite central to his work and he he will often kind of compare you know he'll kind of transpose some of his ideas into that kind of language and say so what does that mean you know when someone tells you there's a 10 percent chance that you will get this what kind of what kind of information are you being provided with is this really information that you can act on and um i guess the one thing i one thing I have already translated of, of, of his is a, is a piece called Language and End Time. Um, I think I brought it up. I think I've got a, a quote on the slide where he, he tries to kind of say, so he comes up with this translation work, right? And it kind of speaks back to, I guess, the mortgage brokers and all the kind of information they're given to you. And he's saying what is required is not just translation work, not just the kind of like delivery of so what are they the plain english version of the contract you're say, signing but um what is required is to see truth as consisting in the process of transportation itself and the effect it has so he's kind of trying to say it's not the message that comes with these documents that is the problem but that we now live in a world in which everyone's life is someone else's business and someone um and i guess this kind of compartmentalization and outsourcing of life is not something that he says we should combat. We should again be, you know, kind of unified, harmonious beings. He's just trying to say we we pretend that we are, when so obviously we're not, <laughs> right? And, and the moment we take that into account, the better. And I guess with Google, the great example, right? We 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 all feel super smart because we have instant access to all this knowledge and in, like, and so often forget that it's precisely knowledge really, that we just yeah, sorry, I was going to jump in here. Yeah, because <laughs> I actually missed the first bit. So sorry, I was still in another meeting. I put a message in the chat just to apologize because I'm deeply apologetic. I actually did want to catch the whole thing, but I missed the first bit because I had to finish a thing. But it's interesting. Yeah, no, that was the, the other thing I was thinking of to do with the monstrosity is to think of these instantaneous interactions 
as feeding into the archive as some textual kind of repository where there's a gravity to them that some people don't realize, although you kind of do, um, if you're speaking in a kind of professional context, you can't have unguarded moments, right? You can always have to be on message. You always have to be speaking as if the thing that you're writing could come back and haunt you <laughs> like um, yeah. in, in years, in years time, because it never goes away. It, there's a, there's an ongoing and permanent um, kind of interaction, but yeah, that was just the other thing I thought of, but I should check out that <laughs> the thing at thesis 11, mate, I'll go have a look at it because it looks really cool. No. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. No, I mean, we have um, just quickly coming back on the coming back to home. Um, one of the examples I, I've used and which also forms into this humor bit is um, Ken Jennings, who was the all time Jeopardy champion. The Jeopardy champion earned millions of dollars in 2012. He lost to an artificial intelligence and was like, very, he's a very kind of cocky guy. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right English word. He's very confident, right? And very kind of rude. And then he was publicly humiliated at his own game by this by this computer voice. And you can see him really suffering in, in the limelight. And then he gave this TED talk where he talks of himself as the kind of obsolete know-it-all. And he jokes about, oh, this will happen to all of us. And um, so it's a very public, I guess, or, uh, obvious example of Promethean shame being humiliated by a machine. But the irony is, is that the algorithm was trained on Ken Jennings' own gameplay. <laughs> so there was this whole archive <laughs> of like, thousands and thousands of hours of jeopardy <laughs> that they could use to kind of program an algorithm that could understand those little jokey cues because everyone said well it's very easy to to create a chess computer because it's just maths but no you know computer couldn't play jeopardy because you have to get the linguistic wit and humor and it wasn't hard at all it, you just needed the amount <laughs> the right amount of data set enough computing power and the answer will be there so so that's i guess the kind of similar the kind of structure that is ongoing at the moment questions chris i guess i just had a, a question thinking about david, david had his hand up david has got a hand up david oh sorry obscured by my ring light <laughs> oh, yeah, what? Go ahead. sorry <laughs> sorry what was that what was i being obscured by you're obscured by my ring light, which is clipped to the top. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Which is covering okay. the hand. So my apologies. Go ahead. No, no, no. Good to know. Um, yeah, no, thank you. Um, well, I'll look forward to your question too, Kat. But, um, but mine was just kind of, I guess, kind of to some extent following on from Glenn's. But, you know, I was thinking about, like, you know, I was quite interested in what you were saying about the compensation of humour, you know, humour being used as this device to kind of, to make the truly monstrous into something that's kind of more okay because we can laugh about it and laugh it off. Um, and yeah, and I was sort of thinking, it kind of just got me thinking about the kind of construction of uh, Zuckerberg himself um, in that joke, you know, like, um, because it, it strikes me that, you know, we do make Zuckerberg into this monster, right? Um, like that Zuckerberg himself becomes kind of symbolic of this and, you know, he's kind of like lizard man and all of that sort of thing. Um, but at the same time, like there's something that's also kind of deeply reassuring about saying that this system is a, an individual right it's not a system that is kind of beyond the control of all of us which i think is probably more the picture that you know that is our deepest fear at the moment is that you know if we think about climate change if we think about you know the global financial crisis and the sort of analysis they did of on inside job of that where it was like literally nobody was in control of these systems right um so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of just kind of interested in kind of like these kind of apocalyptic compensations, I guess. Yeah, no, and, and I think that's a, an excellent observation about Mark Zuckerberg becoming the monster. And, and, and I think a lot of, it would be so nice if it could just be pinned onto someone, right? Um, I guess the, the logic that underpins the structure of thinking that Anders is putting out is kind of saying, unfortunately, like the more this technological reality become, uh, is established, the easier it becomes for, for kind of scrupulous or ruthless people or, or very, not necessarily evil, but very kind of 
blinkered people to suddenly get all this power and this wealth, right? He calls it the, the oligarchic principle of technology. That was one of the without us um, kind of slogans. So it's very easy to, to map with onto something like a nuclear bomb because it has this kind of strange reality in which, you know, it has to be made by millions of people. Um, it has to be maintained by thousands of people who are employees and get their check. But at the end of the day, we have this fantasy that someone can just push the button. <laughs> you know, the, the fear about Donald Trump, like being insulted on Twitter and then just saying, oh, I'm going to nuke that guy or whatever, is, it was kind of a very tangible thing that is, again, trying to, to point out that what is monstrous is that we suddenly are in the situation where very small or thoughtless actions can have these massive consequences or the thoughtless actions of many can build up into that. And so for me, I am also, I guess, fascinated by, there is clearly a very dark strand of humor that has come into the kind of popular imaginary. As a cultural studies scholar, it's very interesting to see, you know, like Black Mirror is, I guess, the, the ultimate example of the kind of the flip side of that. Um, but as I started to work on it, I actually started to realize, well, in a sense, the very lighthearted, seemingly super inconsequential memes that just document the experience of being online, they, they kind of seem suddenly more interesting. And it was also something I read about early interface design when people came up. Uh, I think Wendy Chan writes about this. I'm not quite sure where I read it. but. Um, when they first programmed the computer, it would just always crash and it would just switch off. And then they realized that like people got completely, you know, they wouldn't trust the computer anymore and they wouldn't use it. So they somehow had to pin the mistake onto the human user. And to do that, they just had a little box come up that says, oh, error 754 has occurred and you have to press okay, or you have to press okay. but there's no other choice. You can't not, you can't say, no, that's not okay. <laughs> you can't say something like that. And it establishes this emotional structure in which suddenly the user thinks, oh, I've done something wrong. I, I, and you apologize to the machine. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm not very good at using computers. But actually it's a faulty, it's a flaw in the program. It's a glitch in the machine. It's not the fault of the user. So it's this kind of co-optive trick that I'm, it's kind of deflective humor that I think there's something there. I'm not quite sure yet uh, how it's all going to come together, but I think it, yeah, I think that form of the lighthearted humor to deal with the monsters is kind of quite, quite interesting. Let's put it that way. And sort of, and the implication is it's kind of productive of it as well, right? It's not just, kind yeah. Of, it's not just an in denial, it's a denial that enables, you know. So. Exactly. It's a necessary component of, I think, if we really, I think, I guess that's what I was trying to say earlier with these memes. If, if Facebook couldn't generate the kind of very public confessions about not caring about this nonchalance, we all have to collectively not care about it. <laughs> and it needs to be able to generate the feeling that it's okay not to care about it and that it's all very complicated and, and that, you know, we as individuals can't do anything against these really powerful companies. So I think if they couldn't generate that, that structure of feeling, the power couldn't be there in a very literal sense. You know, it, it wouldn't be possible. If there was always a camera crew standing next to you filming you, <laughs> you would at some point say, hey, can you please just go away? <laughs> and I think that's the kind of... It has to do with this kind of monstrous invisibility. That's what Anders is saying. It's like, it's either hidden from us or it's too big for us to see, but both of them amount to the same. So th that's kind of that structure. But, but thanks, that's really helpful. That, uh, that question was, was really, uh, really you. good. Yeah. Okay, so it's 1.31. Um, so thank you so much, Chris, for um, presenting today. It really was um, fascinating. Uh, and I, look, I think if anyone else has any questions that they didn't have the opportunity to ask, I'm sure Chris wouldn't mind if you shot him through an email. Um, but um, thanks.
everyone. And um, what was my question? Oh, look, it's not a quick one. It was more. It was more about your comments around spaces of possibilities and assemblages and and that sort of thing. But. We can chat about that another time, I'm sure. Okay. Thanks, David. Um, right, so thanks again, Chris, and take care, everyone. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.